I communed with my Lord. I said, precious Jesus. I saw Jesus in the Holy of Holies of the Heavenly Sanctuary, so to speak, with his hands outstretched before the Father, with the prince in his hands. See? And I said, Lord, you know, before I die, I would surely love to see your glory shine upon us. I said, would you, by the, the power, the spirit of life in thee, that great power that raised up Lazarus from the dead, bring Mr. Smith back to life? And immediately, I did not even have to say amen, a shout took place in that room. Heart Research Center presents Incredible Answers to Prayer with best-selling author Roger Morneau. Since retiring from work, Roger Morneau has dedicated his life to prayer ministry. In this first of two parts, Roger relates how God spared his own life in order to develop a prayer ministry, and he shares steps he has learned over the years for true spirit-led intercessory prayer. Joining Roger in this first part is his wife Hilda, who has also witnessed miracles and lives transformed as the direct result of answered prayers. Conducting this exclusive interview are Dan and Karen Houghton of Heart Research Center. Let's now join the Houghtons and the Morneaus in part one of Incredible Answers to Prayer. It is a delight for us to be here with you, Roger and Hilda, to visit together, to have a little window into your experience with the Lord and with many other things. And to begin our visit here in your home tonight, I uh, just wanted to have you, Roger, give us a little bit of a background. Uh, tell us about uh, whenever you were a child, uh, your home, I believe you were from Canada. Right. Uh, give us a little bit of a background as to uh, your upbringing. Mm -hmm. Well, I was uh, born and, and raised in Saint-Jacques, New Brunswick, <laughs> which is about uh, 25 miles from the border of, of the province of Quebec. And it's a totally French area. My parents were French Catholics. On the, my father's side of the family, uh, his younger brother was a priest, which became a monseigneur, and he had two of his sisters that were nuns. So in our home, we did a lot of praying and a lot of calling on the saints. And uh, from there on, uh, when I got to be 12 years of age, m my mother died. And um, That's a tough thing for I, anyone to experience, isn't it? Yeah, and I kind of uh, felt that God wasn't just in dealing with people. And this is where I started to uh, kind of uh, lose my interest in spiritual things. So that was the beginning of your loss yeah. of interest in spiritual things. Yeah. But by the time you joined the Canadian Merchant Navy, is mm -hmm. that the name That's for correct, it? Yeah. You really were an atheist, weren't you? Well, uh, I became one at that time. Okay. <laughs> I was aboard a ship and the uh, chief engineer was a well-read person. And he had a bookcase, good-sized bookcase, and he told us I was one of the firemen. So any of his boys back half, he said, you can have any of my books in time you want to read, you know. And uh, I, to my great surprise, I find out that, that he had uh, Darwin's books and uh, Thomas Huxley and some of the uh, evolutionists, you know. And I got studying this material, and before too long, in reading the words of the infidels, I decided that uh, God was, a, was not a personal person, personal God. He was uh, a... Um, kind of a moving force in the universe mm. that uh, didn't have real interest in humanity. See. And that's when I decided that, well, that's it. There's no God, so to speak, as a person. And so you were approximately what age at that time, Roger? About uh, 17 years of age. Okay. So you from, okay. So in your late teens, you just really checked out on God. Yeah. Now, your I sweet wife, your sweet wife here. When did, when did you two meet? We met in Montreal in, in 1946. 1946? Yeah. I became a member of the Seventh Adventist Church. And um, we married in the fall of 47. Uh, and you're also, Hilda, from a French Catholic French, background? Right. Except uh, my grandmothers were both English. Oh. And they raised their children English, so my father and my mother were more English than they were French in language-wise. 
that they were really French blood. And so I was raised English also. Now I know that there was a very interesting story that I'm already aware of, but maybe you'd like to share with our viewers about how uh, Roger proposed to you. <laughs> well, this is really a happy time for us and our memories. Um, Roger and I had been out uh, for a nice r trip around the city. We have two-decker uh, tramways in Montreal, and so we had gotten up on the top. It was a beautiful evening, and uh, we realized that we cared enough for one another that we would never want to be separated, but we didn't express it then until we finally got to uh, a convalescent nurse uh, home that I was working at. And uh, then he says to me, I love you enough that I want you to be my wife. Will you marry me? And I said, boy, will I marry you? I love you so, yeah. And right at that moment, what happened? That moment, the watchman, the Roger, I had pressed the, the the bell to let the watchman know I had to come in because he had to be in by 11 and uh, usually he took his good old time to come and answer if I was alone so I right and it was cold but this time he was right there at the door and he was upset he said because well, I kissed him and he kissed me and we were really enjoying what, being what together. What are you two doing he says. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, right. You want to come in or you want to stay out there? Yeah, so <laughs> I had no choice. So then uh, I said, "Well, you know, it's not every night that a girl gets asked to be married." <laughs> and then he felt a little. So bad. then he, he felt, felt sure. then he felt he better felt about it. Yeah, he said, "Well, <laughs> congratulations," and he went on his merry way. But <laughs> I imagine with quite a few of us coming in at all these different times, so it's annoying to him. But well, I, that's a fascinating fascinating story about. I'm sure everyone can remember when they went through either proposing or being proposed to that are married uh, anyway. Right. You know, Roger, there are special times in history where we have seen God pull back the veil and allow the human family to see the unseen. Right. You can think of Daniel. You can think of John the Revelator. Mm -hmm. Even looking back at Enoch, uh, Enoch walked with God. I think of what the Apostle Paul said in his uh, letter to the Corinthians, found in, I believe, at 2 Corinthians um, chapter 4 and verse 4. He tells us to look not a, at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. And what I would like to do in our visit today is to be able to pull back the curtain, the veil, mm -hmm. to be able to see what is happening in the <coughs> unseen world through your experience so that many people may be blessed as they realize that what we see on this earth is not all there is. Now, the question that I want to ask you and Hilda first, and we'll come to Hilda in just a moment. You know, you've developed, Roger, quite a reputation as a man of prayer. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> your, your two books, first the book Trip into the Supernatural and your second book Incredible <clears throat> Answers to Prayer have been read far and wide, and many people have been blessed by that testimony. I want you to tell us first a little bit about the experience that you had, the situation that you and Hilda found yourself in several years ago. I understand mm -hmm. you were up in the Niagara Falls area yeah. visiting on a vacation. We were visiting her mother <coughs> on the weekend, and uh, we'd come in on Friday night, Friday, like 7 o'clock at night, and uh, I wasn't feeling that great, but I wasn't really sick. and. Uh, went to bed early. And during the night I woke up about 3 o'clock in the morning and I was perspiring profusely. And I said, oh, what is the matter with me? So I figured that the room was, was just too warm. See? Mother did have the heat up sometimes. It was yeah. around 80 or 90. In <laughs> yeah. that room it was very warm. Mm -hmm. So I opened the window up about 4 inches, but it was very cold out, outside. And that revived me some and I s stopped perspiring. But about another half hour later, I had the same problem again. So I opened the window some more, and by 6 o'clock in the morning, the window was wide open. And I didn't realize that, you know, that I was really sick 
I didn't feel uh, sick or anything, but I didn't feel good either. And after uh, showering, I realized that I had no more energy left in me. You knew it was serious. Yeah. And I told Hilda, I said, you want to take me to the hospital as soon as possible. And so you ended up in the hospital. Yeah. Hilda, what happened right at that time? Well, I'm going to go back a little bit because I had worked all night the night before. And so... And you're a nurse. That's, right, is that right? Right. I'm an LPN and I was working in a nursing home and worked nights. And so uh, we had traveled mother to mothers and... Um, when we got there, I was very tired, and so I was out. I slept. Mother, in the meantime, was up hearing Roger. So in the morning when I woke up, she said to Hilda, I don't think Roger is very well. She said, he's been up and down, up and down all night. I never heard him, and I felt terrible. So anyway, when I saw him, his color was quite gray. And uh, I said, well, we're going to have to take him to the hospital. Because being a nurse, I went all to pieces. I should have known. I should have taken his blood pressure, his pulse, or something. And but I didn't. the worst, don't you? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, then I said, well, I've got to take him to New York City, you know, New York State. Because yeah. I thought maybe our insurance won't cover him in Ontario. So we. I got everything packed in the car that I we needed and took him out to the, got him out in the car. He needed help getting into the car even from uh, mother's mm -hmm. apartment. So uh, as I was pulled, as I pulled out of the driveway and just traveled maybe about four or five houses, I looked over to him and he was really ashen. But he wasn't only ashen, he had the perspiration. Mm -hmm. It was just profusely all over his body. Fortunately enough, there was a pharmacy. So I stopped the car and ran out and asked him where the hospital was. I didn't even know where the hospital was in Niagara Falls. So uh, they told me where it was, about four or five blocks from where I was. So I rushed him to the emergency door and rushed in and told him my husband, I believe, was having a heart attack. And was and it a heart attack, Roger? I was admitted with uh, congestive heart failure and atrial fibrillation. And they couldn't uh, reverse the fibrillation for a long, long time. So you for were a of days. You were pretty close to death oh, yeah. in, the, in the intensive care unit yeah. of that hospital. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me, what went through your mind? You know, they say that whenever you're facing death, your mm -hmm. whole life passes before you. What, hap how, what was your experience there? It's true. <clears throat> I realized that probably I was going to die, you know. I thought he was. Because uh, there was not much energy left in me at all. Just to turn my head on the pillow, I had to make a concentrated effort. See? So I figured that uh, I wouldn't be around too long. But somehow, I managed to live till Sunday evening. And what day did this happen on? Well, this was on, on Saturday morning okay. that I was admitted. Okay. And by Sunday night, Sunday evening, about uh, 8 o'clock, as I was looking at all the, the sick people, they, they had, uh, I believe, something like 14 rooms, sort of glass in units. And then they had that all filled up with uh, emergency okay. people. Yeah. Okay. And they had me in a bed near the, the uh, nurse's station. And as I looked at all of these people that were having a terrible hard time, I figured, well, not too many of those are going to get out of here alive, probably including me. And um, then a, a strange thought came into my mind. Years back when I had become a spiritist, I remember the, uh, the high priest telling us that when uh, people are dying, demon spirits enjoy to see people die. And when there's a lot of people dying, like in a war, in a battle, uh, they have a celebration over it. And I said to myself, they're going to have a celebration tonight because it looks like half of the people here is going to go under. So as my habit of many, many years to converse with the Lord in prayer, I prayed for these people. The Lord, there's a lot of people here that tonight that probably have not expected to be here. And what does the future hold for them? 
And I felt that, you know, the Spirit of God was needed to bless the lives of the people, to prepare them to make the decision, the right decision for eternity, mm -hmm. if they were not going to pull through this. But at the same time, I asked the Lord to bless the people, if at all possible, in His goodness and His grace. We're living in the land of the enemy, so we're like, you know, in a war zone. And I asked the Lord to bless these people and help them. And what happened? And what happened? Things got worse. <laughs> Very bad. <laughs> Were you sorry you had prayed that way for a little while? After a, a few minutes, I said, my goodness, I said, this is terrible. Because the head nurse had to call for help, you know, to have nurses, uh, need two more nurses, whatever it was. So uh, this thing was getting bad because the people were really going through a very, very deep crisis. The man to my right, the man to my left, this man was 39 years of age and had three heart attacks and he told me, he said, you're not too good, huh? I said, no. He said, I've had three heart attacks. He says, I'm going to die probably within another few couple of days because says, the doctor says my heart is too bad. I'm going to, I'm going to go under probably. Damage. Damage. So um, <clears throat> it so happened that these people were having a tremendous struggle. Those that, that were seen fairly well off became very distressed physically. You could just sense the whole place yeah. changing. Yeah. The old, uh, the atmosphere of the place changed. Uh, you know, you can't tell on the nurses' faces the, the sense of urgency and, 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 and they become very distressed. These people that work in the intensive care units, I think, are especially uh, blessed of God with the capacity to help people in distress. But at that time, it, it got so bad that they were afraid that all the people were going to die, probably, you see. So um, then it, uh, it really happened. In Unit 9, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, was there and uh, his heart stopped and the buzzer or whatever you have in the nurse's station uh, the uh, head nurse uh, gave a, a code number and says all doctors please rush in to the ICU we have an emergency and the three doctors came rushing in and, and uh, the, the doctor says where's the resuscitator and, and, and they, they had left it at the other end of the unit and she had to rush the nurse to get the resuscitator and bring it back to the other end where the man was. They worked on the fellow for about 10 minutes. Then one doctor came out and he said uh, to the nurse at the station, he says, we're not going to revive him this time because this guy is he's he's gone. gone. So immediately, I felt a sense of urgency. And as my custom was over the years to have communion with the Lord, whether I'm driving down the road or, you know, or doing manual uh, work or something like that, I communed with my Lord. I said, precious Jesus. I saw Jesus in the holy of holies of the heavenly sanctuary, so to speak, with his hands outstretched before the Father, with the prince in his hands. See? And I said, Lord, you know, before I die, I would surely love to see uh, your glory shine upon us. And I said, would you, by the, the power, the spirit of life in thee, that great power that raised up Lazarus from the dead, bring Mr. Smith back to life? And immediately, I did not even have to say amen, a shout took place in that room. There was four or five nurses there, and there was two, two doctors. And he started to talk all, all at one time. The doctor goes, I can't believe it. The doctor says, I can't believe it. He's sitting up in bed, you know. So the doctor, Mr. Smith, says, hey, look, they don't feed you around here. He's a big Irish guy, you know, with a big low voice. And he says, you know, doctor, he says, they haven't fed me in days. But Mr. Smith had told you that he wanted to die. He didn't want to eat. He didn't want to eat anything. See? He didn't want to drink anything. He wouldn't take All of a sudden, he had his appetite back. Yeah. And he said to the doctor, get me something to eat. So the doctor came to the nurse and said, can we get some food with this man this late at night? And then it was, you know, going on nine o'clock. And she says, oh, okay, we'll get some food. And the next day, they put him on the, uh, on the floor on the, in the uh, cardiac unit, right? Okay, now let me make sure I get yeah. this straight. You're in the intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. It takes all of your energy to move your head from side to side. Yeah. And you sense that the demonic forces are going to enjoy watching oh, yeah. these people die, including mm -hmm. yourself, and you begin to pray when you can't even hardly move. Mm -hmm. My and head was nice and clear. 
Your head was clear, but your but your body was not. Yeah, the body was. And you began shot. to pray, and all of a sudden things changed. And this man was the most dramatic. But what about the rest of the people that well, were in that in that the, intensive care unit? The marvelous thing about it all is that after Mr. Uh, Smith uh, was back too and talking, within five minutes, the the urgency of the place had completely passed. It's like a big storm had blown over. The little old man on my side went to, was gone to sleep. The other guy over here says, you know, he says, somehow I feel like I'm going to live a long time. Hmm. Why would he tell me that? You know, I feel good. He said, I, I bet you said tomorrow, so I get out of this place. You know, I'm looking at him and he, I'm half dead and he's telling me that. <laughs> you know that all of the people were falling asleep or they had no more distress. And the nurses were standing in, in the doorways of those glass in the rooms. And they were talking to one another. I never seen anything like this. Have you ever seen anything like this take place in your life? And then the doctor came out, the old doctor. And he said to the nurse, he said, you know, I have never seen anything like this in all my years. I don't know what's taking place in this, in this, in this intensive care unit this evening. Can't figure it out. It was like the tempest had been calm. Yeah. Did you ever share with Mr. Smith or any of the other patients that you'd been praying for them? Oh yes, four days later, I was on the uh, cardiac uh, floor also, and my room was almost across from, from his, and I went and visited with him and his wife and uh, mm -hmm. told him about the fact that I had prayed for them. She's forever thankful to us, huh? Yes. She was writing to Hilda for every uh, Christmas. Right, we yeah. always kept touch. The man never had problems with his heart after that. And then five years, no, he lived five years after there because that was 1984, December 1984. And uh, a couple of years ago, he died suddenly in, 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 in uh, his kitchen hmm. at night. Yeah. But he had five extra years. Five yeah. extra years. From what he probably would Good have Good years. Oh, yes, he was able, he was a, a union leader, you know for the uh, steel mill, whatever and They had an opportunity to read your first book. Oh yeah, book. they read my first book, and the daughter, the daughter, uh, right. from what I gather, that lives in Toronto, I might... Uh, I, she was involved a little with spiritualism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she really did enjoy that book a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, what about you, Roger? You're laying there still, very weak, and you see these miraculous events taking place around you, mm -hmm in answer to the prayers that you were laying before the throne of God, what about you? Do you always just pray for other people or do you also pray for yourself? Pray for myself sometimes? also. <laughs> but I've already said my prayers to the Lord about myself. See? Only till the early in the morning. So um, I said to the Lord, I felt like, my, wouldn't it be beautiful to live, to be able to pray for people? Why do we have the, the chance to pray for people? I've never been able to pray for people very much in, in my life, except when I'm driving down the road because I was a salesman all my life. So a lot of the praying was done at the wheel, <laughs> you know, on the run, so to speak. And I said, my, would it be wonderful if I could see the glory of the Lord more times in my life, see? And uh, that's where it stayed until the Wednesday night. Tuesday morning, the, the, the doctor says, we've tried everything, Mr. Mono, to help you and we can't. Uh, because I asked him, I said, how's, how's everything uh, looking? He says, I guess I can't, I can't tell you, I can't give you any false hopes. He says, we've done everything we can for you and we can't help. He says, only one more procedure that we can try if you want to. We'll stop your, your heart with the 50 volts of electricity and restart it with 20, 200 volts. And sometimes it helps in a case such as yours. I said, I'll have it done. He said, aren't you going to, uh, I said, as soon as possible. Why don't you go talk to your wife? I said, uh, it's not going to help me whether she knows or doesn't know, you know. <laughs> I said, let's do it now. <laughs> he so didn't he, want to concern me about yeah, it. He, he didn't went, want me to worry. So the, the nurse rushed in the papers. You're going to have to sign these papers. And I signed the papers and they, they um, did the procedure. And uh, in the afternoon, he told me that he would give me a report in the afternoon. He said, uh, it hasn't helped at all. I thanked him. I thanked him. Then, uh, 3 o'clock that morning, 
I said to the Lord, there's a reason why I'm not dying. He said, I didn't want to die, of course, because I have a lovely wife, and, and, you know, and, and nice kids. And, and grandkids. That's right. And, and, you know, I said to myself, it is a strange thing that I'm not getting any better, I'm not getting any worse. Roger, exactly what was wrong with your heart? You've been in the hospital, you didn't get better, you didn't get worse. What was the problem? Well, a virus damaged my heart badly. Did irreparable damage, so the medical science cannot help. And actually, at that time, a part of my heart actually died, and it still has not revived. But my cardiologist tells me that it's a kind of a miracle. Instead of the the heart disintegrating and killing it itself, killing me, it has turned into a substance that's very hard, almost like leather. There's no Flexing there, right? Now, this is just a portion, the lower yeah, portion the of your heart? the lower ventricle. I mean, left ventricle, excuse me. Pardon. He says it's a, it's a good size uh, area. And after we've had, uh, I was here at the General Hospital in Binghamton, after we came from Niagara Falls, the uh, cardiologist had uh, uh, heart catheterization. And uh, other tests run, and all that's where they find out where the damage was. He told oh, my wife that I wouldn't live but a short while. Right. Okay, so you, you had prayed and said, Lord, if you could just keep me alive to pray. Yes. Uh, by Tuesday night, uh, I said to myself, why am I alive? You see, the doctor says, Jesus, I'm so bad. <laughs> then I got thinking. I said, Lord, do you have a reason for me to stay alive? I said, that. I, said I have one. And I said, Lord, if it be to the honor and authority of your holy name, give me the chance to be able to pray for people, that I may come out of this place alive and be able to pray for people the way that I saw you bless the lives of these people here tonight. And um, this was 3 o'clock in the morning, on Wednesday morning. And uh, at six, I went to sleep again after taking my medication, and I woke up at uh, six thirty. The lady with the the blood uh, lab girl lab girl came in with her uh, <laughs> equipment to draw more blood, and uh, she said, "You look good today." I said, "Thank you. I feel real good. I felt real good." And the doctor was all amazed about it. Oh, well, by the way, these other people on on Monday morning, the doctors came in found that half of their people <laughs> were well enough to, to go to different parts of the hospital, different floors, and, and a couple of people only went right home. The guy next to me had three heart attacks. He says, dog, dog, there's nothing wrong with me. I feel, feel like a million. So that whole group of people that were in that intensive care unit that Yeah, night, were blessed at the time. And all of them went out of the hospital and went home. Well, no, a couple of them were sent directly home, but the others were put on different floors of the hospital. Okay, so yeah. they went to a lesser critical care right, area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the man at my left he, that had all these heart attacks and thought he was going to die and all that, he left jubilant. Hilda? The doctor says. Now, Roger has a reputation for praying. Is he the only person in this household that prays? No. What were you I doing during all this I, time? I prayed continuously. You don't know how much I was praying when I was driving because, you know, you just can't think of anything else but uh, getting to the destination without an accident because it's so easy to do. You want to go through the red lights and, you know, if we would have had an escort, it would have maybe helped us, but we didn't. So the Lord was with me to be able to get him there. 20 minutes, the doctor said, and he would have been gone. He said in 20 minutes, he wouldn't have so been able to. So all the time he was in the hospital, yes. you were there with him as much yes, as you could I be. Was there as for hours, even though I could only see him for 10 minutes every two hours. I was in their waiting room praying with the other members of the family I know that were praying for their, their people. For their people, and I would pray for them too. But my husband was so ill. My mother was able to come and see him once, and she wouldn't go back because he, she couldn't. Her heart hurt too much to see him the way he was. She couldn't believe it because he had been so well. This man had never been sick, ever. Never been sick. Hardly had a cold. 
It was you, devastating to me at first, yes. You also spoke to Mrs. Smith, yes, the person. Yes. And what was her reaction to all of this? She was uh, thrilled, thrilled that her husband was eating. She was just a new lady altogether. She's a beautiful woman, and she's had such a happy, and she knew Roger was very ill and she said she was praying for him too but she was overjoyed that he would eat because he would not even take water before that he wanted to he die, wanted to die. Mm -hmm. just thrilled one more thing that comes to my mind Roger about this experience mm -hmm. you prayed and said Lord if it be your will that there's a purpose for me mm -hmm. and you were thinking just what you said a moment yeah. ago about praying for people mm -hmm. Did you expect to be fully healed? What happened? When you got back and found out that part of your heart was, was not functioning, did that give you any discouragement? No, I hadn't asked the Lord to heal me. I'd asked the Lord to make it possible for me to, to get out of this place alive so I can pray for these people, you know, for other people, for other people's needs. Because I felt so, so fortunate that I was still alive, in a way. And I said, Lord, there's so many people praying for me out there. For a lot and, of people. And you hear these prayers. And I said, I'm alive, probably due to that. And I said, you know, it wouldn't take much more to, to get me out of here feeling pretty good. You know, I might not be uh, cured of my heart trouble, but I would appreciate being alive. And uh, I kind of told the Lord I would like to have a prayer ministry. And um, that was 3 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock, 6.30. And I woke up and I was feeling good. The doctor came and he couldn't believe it. He said uh, the monitor was going about 180 to 200 beats per minute, you know, fibrillating. And he could not reverse it. And uh, it was down to 84 beats per minute. The cardiologist came and he looked at this thing and he says, Man, you look good. He said, I had some colors. <laughs> so. I said, yes, feel good too. Well, he said, if you uh, hold on to, to your uh, capacities until 3 o'clock this afternoon, if that good, we'll move you to the floor of the hospital. Cardiac unit. And there I was. And on Saturday, I had been admitted on Saturday morning, and I was out Saturday morning, mm -hmm. walking, so walking to the car. He so wasn't were, too strong, oh no. but he was walking, and were we pleased yeah. and grateful our he said, oh, I voices told were... I told the Lord, he says, if I can get out of, out of here, walking on my own two feet, <laughs> that's all I asked for. You see what I mean? And so you came out of that hospital with the idea that, Lord, you've saved my life. I want to have a prayer ministry. Yeah, that's what I decided. Now, on. you've been praying quite a bit since then. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. How much time do you spend on an average day in prayer, Roger? Well, you see, I, I've prayed all my life. From the time that I was converted to to Christianity in the full, fullest sense of the word, uh, after I left the uh, spirit worship, um, I spent a lot of time talking to the Lord in prayer. And um, I would say that there are some days that I probably pray as much as eight hours out of, 20, out of 24. Because, uh, see, I'm, I'm, I spend most of my time laying down because of my bad heart. So I spend a lot of time writing to people. Uh, reading my mail that comes in and trying to encourage people with letters. And I'm getting a lot of beautiful blessings right and left. And people are, that have acquired my book, Incredible Answers to Prayer, and people are telling me that uh, it has blessed their lives. Well, they thank me for it, but I said, glory to God in the highest. Mm -hmm. See, he's the one that did it all. So Roger, actually, you didn't pray to be healed. You prayed that God would allow you to leave alive and conduct a prayer ministry. Right. Now, has your damaged heart in any way impacted your ability to conduct an intercessory prayer ministry? Well, I feel that um, although I have all this damage to my heart, and it's very confining. In other words, I can't go out if it's too warm. I can't go out if it's too cold. And... Uh, I got to take medication, you know, every day, and I have to have an awful lot of rest. But uh, 
it's a blessing in disguise because while I'm laying down resting, I can think upon all of the people that I pray for. Now, my prayer list in just a few short months has acquired nearly 600 new names. You see, that's my book on the, on the power of intercessory prayer came out. And um, I have it right under my Bible. Elda had bought me this beautiful red covered book. It was about 10 inches in height, 7 inches wide, with 150 pages. And it's building up nicely in there. And I bring this prayer list before the Lord every day and talk to the Lord about certain individuals. And I have like maybe like 25, 30 people that are, you know, real Hard on my mind cases. all the time. Sure. And then there's others that come in, new requests, prayer requests. And then I get, I like to get the letters. The letters are beautiful. I get a lot of letters. And they tell me how the Lord is blessing their lives. You know, people are just writing me and saying, your prayer ministry has, has been such a blessing to me. It's changed my Christian outlook on, on prayer and, you know, on how to pray for others and all. It's a beautiful experience. It thrills my soul. There must be some time, Roger, when you wish that your heart were whole and you could go out and meet all these appointments. People have called and asked you to come and speak at camp meetings or different mm -hmm. events. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't feel bad about it for this reason. If, well, let me tell you a little story. This lady wrote me a letter and she said, Mr. Mono, I still believe that the Lord is going to restore your heart to perfection so that you can do all the things that you want in life. And I liked the letter, and I appreciate what she was trying to do for me. But I wrote her back and said, Dear sister, please don't ask the Lord to make my heart completely well because of the fact he'll wreck my prayer ministry. And I explained to her that uh, I have so many people asking me to, uh, you know, to go and talk at different events and things. And uh, it would take all of my time, and, and I would not have the chance to pray for people. And I believe that that's what the Lord wants me to do, is to pray for people. And I, we're saying many beautiful and wonderful things. And I'm helping other people to pray the way that I do. <laughs> and they're having fantastic results. That blesses my life. When I started to study the Word of God, I was a very hungry person. I just love to read the Word of God. And I read the Bible through in uh, not too long a period of time. And I studied it and uh, got myself involved reading the Spirit Prophecy books, which was just fantastic, wonderful. And there I saw and understood the ministry of the Holy Spirit that we need to have performed in our lives daily. You see, most Christians today, and it's a good way of thinking, like to think about the Holy Spirit uh, blessing the life of, of, of the cousin or the uncle, all these people that you pray for, you see. And it's the thing to do. But this, they don't feel that the Holy Spirit is, can do much for them. Therefore, they don't call upon him. I read a very interesting passage in the, one of the books of the Testimonies of the Church that uh, got my attention very seriously, and I was just a young Christian. Christ has declared that the power of the Spirit was to be with his followers unto the end. But the promise is not appreciated as it should be, and therefore its fulfillment is not seen as it might be. The promise of the Spirit is a matter little thought of. And the servant of the Lord goes writing and she says there that the result of that, we, have, we get their spiritual uh, blindness that sets in and uh, deterioration and spiritual death. And she says, the power of the Spirit which would, which is necessary for the success and the prosperity of the church, the people spiritually, he says, is lacking, though offered in its infinite plenitude. And the mind is taken up with minor matters. That's the way that she explains thing. He says it's a disaster to Christianity. And I got uh, analyzing this uh, thing, and I said, hey, I'm going to look into this to see how the Holy Spirit can do a very special work. And in the same article, the Servant Lord says that there's a certain type of people that if they seek the blessing of the Holy Spirit in their lives, God makes them channels for the outflowing of the highest, influ highest influence in the universe. Talking about the Holy Spirit. So that's maybe a nice thing for me to have. 
I would like to be a channel like that. So I started to, to, to read and, and study the Bible and the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. And I came across a, a most interesting quotation. It's a, a chapter of about 16 lines. It is 16 lines. It's the Desire of Ages, page 671. There the servant of the Lord says that Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross. But he wanted to really bless, you know, live a blessing with his disciples, with the apostles. And um, she talked, she writes there about the Holy Spirit. And she says, <clears throat> to the fact that uh, in describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help that he had provided for the church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. Then the servant of the Lord says that uh, the Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent. And without this, the sacrifice of Christ would be of no avail. Well, I said to myself, this is what I need, a regenerating agent. Regenerate my uh, spiritual battery, so to speak like you would in your car if your alternator <laughs> didn't do the work right. So I got studying and understand this, and uh, she talks about the time that Christ came to this earth. The inhabitants of the unfallen world, this is another area, on page 37 of Desire Ages. She says how the inhabitants of the galaxies of the unfallen worlds look upon planet Earth, and they thought that God was going to arise and sweep the inhabitants of the Earth off the face of the planet. But instead of that, he sent his only son to die. See, so that's what took place. Then she says, when Christ came, now we we'll go back to 671, when Christ came to, to uh, perform his ministry, honored, the power of evil, she says, had been strengthening for centuries. And the submission of men to the satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would, who would come not in, mod in modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. Anyway, I'm almost done with quotation. She says, is a spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It is by the spirit that the heart is made pure. We have trouble with uh, people keeping their hearts pure. It's been done through the Holy Spirit. No, no problem there. And third, she says, Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. I said, thank you, Lord. I'm going to follow the blueprint. So I memorized that. See? And everybody now, the people that, that come to me and, and they say their Christian experience is faltering, their, their fate is not what it should be, they're having a hard time, uh, I write them and says, go to Calvary every day. It takes you four minutes to read it from Pilate's Judgment Hall to Calvary and there to Golgotha. And then, they that for a year, I suggested them. If you follow my, my <laughs> counsel, you're going to reap great dividends, you see. And next, you want to acquaint yourself with the second paragraph of page 671 of the Desire of Ages. Memorize it. I suggest that you read it for 365 times, which means one a day for a year. And by then, you'll have it memorized. And it'll be with you day and night. And like the Lord says to, to Joshua, this book of the law shall not be part of thy mouth but I shall meditate therein day and night, that I may prosper whithersoever thou goest. See? For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. And I have not only based my spiritual life on, on, on the, this advice, I have based my material uh, experience. Books. In other words, uh, it's, uh, selling telephone direct advertising or anything that I sold over the years. The Lord has blessed me both ways because I've, I've followed that blueprint. <laughs> well, that's an outstanding testimony, Roger. Now, back in 1945, you were offered all the wealth and honor this world could yeah. give you. Since that time, you have um, worked in a variety of capacities as a salesman. Has your life been easy? Uh, yes, because of the fact that the Lord made it so. To be a salesman is very difficult work, especially when you don't know how to sell. And I had tried selling before I was a Christian, and I said no, because my dad was a sales 
department. You see, and he, he trafficked in a lot of different things. And uh, he always did well. But in trying to sell uh, ice cream to, uh, in July, I couldn't see. So I said, that's not the, the, the road for me. But you know, after I became a Christian, and I wanted to keep the biblical Sabbath of creation, and that the factory, the unions were coming in, and they were having trouble, and it's going to, you know what I mean, going to have to work Saturday and all of this. Well, I said, I'm getting out of this thing. And I started, I went into sales, and the Lord has blessed marvelously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you Records, I've set records uh, in anything that I was into. The Lord is, was really He's great. been good to you. Yeah. You haven't had the wealth and riches that you were promised, but you know oh. you have that in store. It's coming. You see this, this place here? There's a lot of things that should be improved upon and, and in, uh, you know, uh, to make it more comfortable probably. But we feel uh, quite comfortable. And I said to my wife, it won't be long, we'll be in a mansion, honey. That's right. I got all the measurements figured out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very lovely here, Roger, but I know that you are looking for the real fulfillment yeah. of your life oh, yeah. when the Lord comes. Yeah. When did you first discover the power of prayer? I have experienced the power of prayer by degrees, so to speak. When I became a Christian, as, as I applied my little bit of faith to the medicine of Christ, I find out that I was succeeding in various phases of my Christian living nicely. And I, it, it grew on me. But it was not till 1972 that I made a fantastic discovery, something that just changed my whole way of praying for people. Hmm. And it happened as an accident. No, it's not quite an accident. Uh, it's, it was not an accident. It's, it's, it was of the Lord. But uh, it seemed that way. First, I should say that I'd been reading in the Desire of Ages that the science of salvation cannot be explained, but it can be known by experience. And that intrigued me. It stayed on my mind for at least a good week, maybe 10 days. I tried to figure it out. Then I said to the Lord, Lord, I know that you, you're not going to reveal to me the mysteries, you know, of, of God in heaven. Is, I don't need it. But what about the experience? You see? I like the experience that it can bring. The science of, of salvation can, it can be known by experience. I said, would you give me some experience that would help me to, to be able to, you know, pattern my Christian life in a way that you want it to be successful and victorious? That's all I said. I don't think I ever repeated that prayer again. And a few months later, I'm in Watertown, New York. Now, Watertown is uh, about uh, 100 miles north of here. I was working on a telephone directory, not in that area, but I was coming through Watertown going home on Friday. It was in April, and it was a beautiful April day, and uh, the thermometer went up in, into 78, I think it was. And I decided that I was going to do my paperwork and, and put the report in the mail so it'll reach the office because I was going to be on the weekend quite busy. And I said, I better do my paperwork right now. So I, I pull into the uh, FW Woolworths parking lot. It was kind of pleasant there. Park my car, start doing my, my paperwork. And uh, a few minutes later, a green mercury came and pulled two, sp two spaces away from me. At the wheel was a lady driving the car and her husband. And um, she turned off the ignition. Hey, Mary, go and turn on this, the motor again. I got to put up this power window. The car was uh, maybe 10 years old. And I seen that the power windows didn't work when, <laughs> when the motor wasn't uh, uh, really? turning the generator, alternator. Oh, she said, uh, what was his name now? I think it was Henry. We'll say Henry. Henry, you're so dumb. I've told you a hundred times. To put the windows up, the power windows up, before I turn the ignition off. How many times did I have to tell you? He said, you son of, I mean, you know, daughter of, and he started, man. Oh, wow. Talk about a guy that, 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 that could bring down a, a human being to a level of, low creatures, he mm -hmm. could do it. <laughs> and his face got, I mean, now you see, we were apart horizontally, and uh, I mean, in the way that I could see from the corner of my eye without having to turn my head so much. I look at him, boy, I'm, you know, the nerve in the neck is coming out. 
immediately I turn my mind to the Holy of Holies of the Heavenly Sanctuary. And I see Jesus there standing before the high, you know, as the great high priest uh, between the cherubims with his hands, you know, toward uh, the God the Father, the Prince of the Nail in his hand. And he's waiting for our prayers to offer them to his Father. And I said, Precious Jesus, please forgive this man's iniquities and his sins. He hasn't had his sins forgiven in 20 years, maybe. And demon spirits are driving him crazy. And her, she needs a, a real blessing. They both need it from you at this time. I said, appropriate to them, Lord, the merit of your precious blood. The cost has been paid. Give them the deliverance from demon spirits that they need right now. And I thank you for it. Mister, they were, they were yelling at one another. It's just like somebody had sealed their mouth. Not a word was spoken. Boom. They stopped talking. And it was been maybe at least 20 seconds. It's a long time, 20 or 30 seconds. For when, you, when you're mad and, and you know, you're telling someone off, somebody off, and all of a sudden you stop talking. It was quiet for about 30 seconds. And then he turned to, to Mary and says, you know, Mary, that's just what he did. He twisted himself around, man. Mary says, you know, I, I got to tell you something. He says, you know, Mary, this was a nice day, a real beautiful day. And when you, you told me about the power windows and all that, I got really mad. And you know, I am really sorry about, about that. He, he, he says, please forgive me. Oh, my goodness, to myself, he's asking forgiveness, you know. And I won't use these words again. I'm going to really make a, make a, a big uh, determination, he says, and, and a big effort not to talk to you like that again. And she says, you know, Henry, I'll tell you what. It's my fault a lot of this, this fighting that we have takes place because I find, actually find pleasure to dig you with pointed words. <laughs> you see? But she says, I decided I'm not going to do it no more either. You know, she said, remember what... Uh, oh, yes, guys, comes a little. She said, let's go in the shop. They got out of the car. She put on the, 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 the motor, put the power windows up. They got out of the car, and, and he went to, to put money in the, in, in the meter, and he didn't have any uh, change. So he said, uh, Mary, uh, could I impose upon you for a dime? Feed this meter here. And she come over and look at her in her purse and give him a dime and put it in there. And she giggles, you know, about the thing, you know, you always, you know, out of change and he's a good thing you married me you know i always always have change for the meters and things like that and then she grabbed me by the arm and walked down in, in, in two world wars i said to myself what is this what has happened then immediately the spirit of god told me you have discovered how to appropriate the merits of the blood of christ to the needy and even the wicked and I have a chapter in my book that says, praying for the ungodly and the wicked. You've read the chapters. That's right, it's I a have. beautiful it's chapter. An excellent chapter. Huh. Talk about the power of the Spirit of God. That was it. I started the car. <clears throat> I, I didn't finish my work. Get right down the highway and going home, rejoicing in the Lord, Lord, and praising His holy name. That He had answered my prayers, you know, uh, my right, prayer. That right before your I, eyes. Before my eyes. Mm -hmm. Then I said to the Lord, Lord, tell me that I, I did find a, a real gem here. And, he's, and it's like the Lord says, yes. When Mary Madeleine uh, at Simon's feast, you know, was washing his, uh, his feet uh, with her tears and all that, um, he said to her, thy sins be forgiven. Thy sins are forgiven thee. Nobody had mentioned anything about sins. You see? He said, thy sins are forgiven thee. And Jesus always forgive people's sins. And I said, you know something? Why aren't we as Christians doing a little bit of that work for the ungodly and the wicked? You see? Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, the Lord, Lord, this has been such a beautiful discovery that I'm almost too excited about it. I would like you, Lord, if you'd be kind enough to honor me by giving me another, just one, 
once. That's all I need. One, one real experience that's going to show me, Lord, that I have a special work to do for these people in asking for the forgiveness of their sins and appropriating your, your merits, your precious blood to them. And um, I said, there must be other experiences in the Bible similar to this. And then a few of them passed in my mind, but I won't go through that because it take too long. Then I said, Lord, you're so marvelous. Would you, would you surprise me? You see, a lot of times I did that in, 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 over the years. Would, Lord, would you surprise me? <laughs> and give me another one of those experience, outstanding experiences that will show me for sure that this is the way to help the ungodly and the wicked. To receive grace from on high because they're not going to ask for themselves. They couldn't, this guy, Henry, could, couldn't care less. He hates you. Yeah? Like I did years past. Lord, would you give me another stunning experience like that? And I forgot all about the prayer, right? A month later, we we're on the canvas, telef uh, working on the telephone directory. The supervisor says, uh, Raj, come on in, in my, to my office. I want to talk to you. I said, what's the problem? He said, no problem. He says, uh, well, I have a problem, yes. If it's not a problem for you. I have an account here, he says, that is very difficult to handle. Every year, it's the old timers, you know, they've been working on the, on the book year after year. Don't want to handle this guy. He owns five lumber yards in different towns, you know. And he's a very difficult man to, to find to begin with. And when you find him, you got to have the patience of Job to put up with him because he keeps putting the guys back. Come back tomorrow, come back next week, call me again. Until the canvas is almost all done and the guys got this account, this big account, advertising account in their hands and they, they're worried they're going to, you know, just drop the revenue, you know. It's a lot of money, $300 a month this guy spends on, on, on yellow pages. We can't afford to have anybody drop this business, you know, that's $300 a month, that's $3,600 for the year. You know, he says, there's some real dough here. So what is it that you want me to do? Hey, you've already built a track record as the expert in saving trouble accounts. Would you save this one for me? I said, okay, give it to me. Now I try to find out from the other guys that have handled the account what kind of a character this is. And he gave me a, a story on it. Okay, so I was passing in front of the place at least three or four times a day, going to different businesses in the other, uh, nearby towns. So I would call, drop in, talk to the manager. We'll call him Mr. Brown. Uh, when will Mr. Brown be in so I can add and, you know, go over uh, his advertising program with him? Oh, I don't know. Maybe try Thursday. This was a like huge treasure. And then you come back on Thursday and he says, well, he, oh, man, he's, you, got, you, you came in a bad day. He's in a terrible mood today. You better not talk to him. Come back Monday. So after three or four weeks of this, uh, about two weeks of this thing, now I said, Lord, <laughs> I need help. And I said, uh, this is not going to be easy. And, but I believe that if I prayed, Lord, that you would appropriate the medicine you shed blood in Calvary, your divine blood shed in Calvary for this man, the price has, paid for, has been paid for his salvation, that if I ask you as a fellow mortal in this land of the enemy, I believe, Lord, that, that you can then give this man very special help of the Holy Spirit so that he will not be a monster like he is. So I started to pray for him and for his wife. Because the manager told me, he says, boy, if his, if his wife had started him off in the morning, uh, you know, by yelling at him, he's miserable all day. So I started to pray for this guy. And the following week, I came back in there and I said to the guy, I said, look, it's too late now to, to play games anymore, told the manager. We got to get a definite appointment. I'll tell you what, you have Mr. Brown call a telephone office and make an appointment, set a time that I can't come and take care of his advertisement, or otherwise we're going to take him right out of the book. Because the, ma the sale manager told me that. He says, hey, tell him that. I said, no, I don't feel like doing it. He said, yeah, he says, do it. Okay. So I did what the sale manager says. Well, sure enough, the next uh, afternoon, I came back in, uh, uh, at 5 o'clock, and uh, the telephone office had left a message for me that uh, I was to go and see Mr. Brown on on Monday, we'll see. So I entered a place of business and it was loaded with people. Big lumber yard, man. They sold everything for the building contractors. And um, 
I see the manager back in the counter. He was serving somebody, so I walk over there. He told us his helper, hey, you take care of the customer. I got to see Mr. Morneau, and he said, you really want to see him today? I said, I see him even if I die. This has been part one of Incredible Answers to Prayer, an interview with best-selling author Roger Morneau, as conducted by Dan and Karen Houghton of Heart Research Center. The conclusion of this exclusive interview is contained in part two.